Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited that you're here. Appreciate you coming to learn more about the programming that we do at the Walters Art Museum. Um, and to get started, I'm just curious how many of you have been to the Walters Art Museum before? Fabulous. So if you've not been, it's located in um, Mount Vernon, so the downtown area of Baltimore City. And we are a free institution. We're open between um, Wednesdays and Sundays from 10 until 5, and then extended hours Thursday evenings. So my name is Ashley Hostler, and I um, help to create some of the access programs for our family program audiences. And I'm going to show you a bit today about a um, program that we have called Sensory Morning, which is designed specifically for children with sensory processing disorders and those on the spectrum and their entire families. So just as a bit of an overview, um, the program itself starts an hour before uh, the museum opens to the public. So when we open at 10 a.m. on any other day, um, because we're a public institution, because it's a free institution, um, we can see any number of people coming in and out. But when we set aside program hours for sensory morning, we have an hour beforehand that allows families to come in without um, anyone else from the public. So for these sensory morning events, you'd be coming um, in an hour before and joined by families who have also registered for these events. And our primary goal is to create an environment that is um, free of judgment, that's welcoming, that's safe. We recognize that art museums and, and institutions in general can be pretty overwhelming. Um, we've heard from a lot of families in pre-evaluation materials that um, some you know, concerns about behaviors or about expectations in a museum environment might keep them from coming in on their own. So we really try to address a lot of these things firsthand. And I'll talk a bit more about some of the modifications that we make to ensure that it's um, a very welcoming environment. But our primary goal is to make sure that families can come in and experience the museum itself um, without feeling judged. Um, we also provide sensory break areas and tactile resources. Um, it's a lot of hands-on play for the children who are coming and for the adults for that matter. Um, we run them at this point four times a year. So we um, run one program each semester. The next program that's coming up is March 29th. There is a handout at the back. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how you go about registration. Um, but just to keep on your radar, we do have a program coming up within the next month. The audience is completely unlimited. As I had mentioned, we designed them initially for um, families who are um, on the spectrum or who have sensory processing disorders. However, we have a whole variety of diverse learners who come and sign up for the program. And increasingly, we're really um, also seeing a lot of families who have early learners who want their children to um, have exposure to making um, friends and modeling peer groups. And so that's always something that's really exciting for us as well. Um, and there are no age requirements. We've had children as young as 13 months um, who are registered participants, and um, adults up to about 30 who are registered participants as well. One of the things that we really advocate for is that it's an entire family workshop, so that um, it's not just something that you're doing with one child, but instead experiences for um, those who would benefit most, as well as their siblings and their adults, so that we can provide an entire morning together. Um, when we first started, we worked with an organization called Embrace International. Um, the very first program we ran was in the fall of 2010, um, and the the program itself was developed out of this interest in meeting needs of um, the audiences that uh, you work with and that you're familiar with. As we've expanded, we now have strategic partnerships with Kennedy Krieger, and so one of the things that's made this program really um, thrive and sustainable is the fact that we can ensure that there are qualified um, professionals and volunteers on hand to support with program. Um, we you utilize all of our family program staff um, as well as, as I mentioned, volunteers from Kennedy Krieger. We've had volunteers from other organizations um, also participate, again, with focus of working with diverse learners in mind, um, and then really rely on the support of our security staff at the museum as well. Um, and in terms of marketing, this is one of the things that we've seen develop quite a bit. We have um, come to find that as we've progressed the most successful programs, the numbers have really jumped when we've been able to advertise through social media. So um, providing flyers and information through listservs, but also through Facebook and networks that are connected um, to each other. So as you've walked around Kennedy Krieger before, you've probably seen signage up. 
um, we have you know really strong uh, advertisements through hard copy flyers and then again through getting out to as many service um, providers as we can. Um, so to date, we've been able to offer 11 programs. The program coming up in March will be our 12th morning. Um, they are free programs. We do ask that families register in advance. And again, that's so that we can ensure the intimacy of the program. Um, I do cap registration at about 125 participants and then start a, a wait list. And when we first started, um, in a moment you'll see how our numbers have really grown, but that was not something that we really could even dream of doing. The fact that um, now we have to cap registration is pretty exciting. So as soon as we start promotion of materials, which tends to happen about a month in advance of the program itself, um, families are welcome to start registering. And um, at that time, information uh, confirmation materials are get you know are sent out to follow up as well as pre-visit materials and um, we'll talk a bit about what those look like too. Um, I had mentioned earlier you know that one of our primary goals is to make sure that the environment is free of judgment and to really address concerns of not feeling welcome or being um, you know concerned about what might happen if we go into a museum. When we think about some of the expectations in an art museum setting in particular it's a lot of things that are really challenging for um, for anyone um, but particularly those who um, might have difficulty with keeping hands to themselves or with mod modulating volume and um, so those are things that we address with our security staff going into it. Um, in advance of each program, we meet with our security team to talk about some of the characteristics that they might observe on the morning of and some of the behaviors that um, we are more than welcome to see. All the way on the right, and this looks very similar to the flyer that um, is at the back of the room, um, there is a list of things that we welcome. Again, really wanting to make sure that anyone who registers knows that we are not only expecting, but welcoming for there to be loud sounds. Um, you know, bolting or touching pieces, you know, things like that that ordinarily in an art museum could be really challenging or things that we um, might expect to see and that we're okay with. Uh, in addition, there are some sensory resources, and there are a few out at fr um, front on the table. And we'll talk a bit about those. Those have been designed specifically to um, correspond to some of the thematic uh, content areas of the accessibility programs that we run, um, but are also available for checkout by anyone who comes into the museum between um, 10 and 3 on Saturdays and Sundays. And they have a variety of resources and um, tactile materials to go along with different collection areas. And then in addition to the registration, um, once families have signed up to be a participant, um, we follow up with confirmation materials as well as access to social stories that are designed specifically for the event itself. Um, and so each time we run a program, it might be a different content area. Um, the program that's coming up in March is going to focus specifically on Egyptian art galleries. And so um, the social stories are modified specifically to, to give you a sense of what those spaces look like and what um, might be considered. We also have social stories that address who they're going to see, so what museum staff and volunteers might look like, how they can be identified, as well as just welcoming, or welcoming um, visitors into the space in general. So we talked earlier about some of the ways that we promote. Um, we do have a Facebook page that um, always links to an upcoming program through the Walters Facebook page, and then on our website as well there's a listing of upcoming program dates. Um, so recently, we, as I mentioned, within the past year or so, are so thrilled to be working strategically with Kennedy Krieger to be able to promote these programs and to really expand what our accessible programming looks like. Um, when we move to the graph where you can see that our numbers have really jumped, um, there was an instance where our programming was picked up by Autism Society of Baltimore, Chesapeake, and Pathfinders for Autism, um, and both on their own found our uh, program advertisements and then um, promoted them through Facebook and we saw a huge jump in numbers. So again, that was one of those confirmations for us that social media is really the best way of being able to uh, advocate for the programs that we offer. Um, additionally, I did want to mention, especially for those of you who are, are not aware, I also work with the Smithsonian Institution on their um, accessible mornings. They're called mornings at the museum, and they run theirs um, similarly. They happen to a bit more frequently. Um, and so I'm happy to share those 
dates with you as well. Uh, and then similarly, the Kennedy Center also offers sensory friendly performances. And so when, um, when I meet with the Smithsonian or with Kennedy Center, one of the things we talk about a lot are shared resources for families in the Baltimore and DC area. Um, so I do want you to know that you know, what we're doing at the Walters is very unique, but at the same time, um, there are some institutions not, not that far that are also serving families in very similar ways. So again, um, that idea of really wanting to make sure that all of our visitors feel safe and feel welcome as they come in is always the very um, forefront of what we're doing. And um, the idea that learning happens through play and exploration. So everything that we offer is really hands-on. Um, you'll see in a moment some of the photographs from the events that so you can see exactly how they um, look when an event or when a program is running, but that idea that discovery and play, especially for um, our young learners and early learners is what's going to be most impactful. Um, we, there's no discrimination or no set goal in terms of ability or age. So again, if somebody were to um, contact me wanting to just see what the program is like, even if their child is not fall on um, uh, the spectrum or they don't know if there is a diagnosis yet, those are always families that we really want to have at the program as well. Um, it is free. It will remain a free program. Um, and we utilize both the permanent collection and our special exhibition spaces to create programming that goes in line with the work that we have at the museum. So. Um, as you'll see moving forward, I'll break down some of the spaces that are constantly utilized when we have our sensory morning events. You'll see photographs and then also some of the um, comments that have come directly from participants. And as I noted earlier, we are uh, just about to start our 12th program. So over the past 11 programs, we've really gotten some um, incredible feedback from families. Um, we have modified some of our evaluations to be a bit more pointed and to really make sure that we are um, addressing some of the concerns or suggestions that families have. Um, so you'll see some of those tidbits as well. So with each of our programs, we always offer the same types of areas or the same variety of activities, but what changes is what the activities are based on the theme of the program. There's always an opportunity for yoga within the galleries and movement activities. And as much as possible, again, we connect them to works of art. So in this photograph, you can see that there's a large um, narrative painting behind our educator, and um, it allows her to make connections directly to the works of art, but also just kind of follow the lead of the children who are interested in staying with her. Um, over those two hours of the program, families are invited to come into the space and move through at their leisure. So we've had families who have stayed at one activity station the entire two hours. We've had families who have come for 20 minutes at 9 a.m. and that is exactly what they needed and um, you know that met their, uh, you know, expectations of the program itself. Um, and then we also have several stations that can be used or can be um, accessed throughout the entire program. So the yoga you'll see, the gallery stations, there's a sensory break area, um, and then most recently there was also a resource fair. So some of those are coming up. Again, yoga in the galleries. When we are not utilizing the sculpture court, we've had um, yoga on the court as well. So gallery activities, again, this is what would change each program based on the theme of the program itself and where in the museum we are. This is from our most recent program for those of you who were volunteering. And some of the things that we learn from families um, quite a bit and hear repeatedly, again, is that it's an opportunity for them to get to enjoy the museum where otherwise they would not have um, felt confident or comfortable doing so on their own. Um, stations are always set up on the floor and um, staffed at all times by our educators and by therapists with a variety of activities and materials, um, but set up in a way where it's child directed and they are coming to stations based on their interests, staying as long as they want based on their interests. So there are no expectations in terms of, um, you know, or, or requirements uh, to meet in terms of what areas they go to and how long they participate. 
and as much as possible with each of the um, activity stations there's a wide range of resources, touch materials, um, activities that engage questioning and further thinking, um, suggestions for conversations that can be had between adult and child, um, and you know, trying to address as many different uh, levels and abilities and um, different modes of thinking as possible. Could I ask, was that sure. a picnic? Sure. It was a picnic. Yeah, so um, in this photograph, the painting that's on the wall behind is um, allegory of the element earth. And so it's, it's filled with a bunch of different fruits and vegetables. And um, it's a narrative of people collecting different foods. So at this station, there were a bunch of um, different things that could be utilized. There were a bunch of um, fake fruits and vegetables that children could sort and put into picnic baskets and have a picnic of their own. Um, in the bins that are coming out towards the front were um, a variety of stickers related to food pyramid, food groups in general. So there was an activity for um, sorting and creating their own picnic on paper plates. Um, mm -hmm. When yeah. this arrangement for picnic is set up, the problem I'm having is that is it by invitation or is it open-ended? That is, you can walk in and decide to go on. I've, I've been to the Walters where you accommodate at the different floor levels, mm -hmm. different age uh, appropriate activities. Now, with the picnic, you're providing certain food, but the limitations that you have in entering the building are relative to knowing what you could actually bring in and what is appropriate and what's not. Um, I'm a member of the Walters, but one of the problems I have is how could we define what is necessary to bring the right accoutrements with us to fit in the setting that you have presented before us. My concern is that we don't have enough information ahead of time. Now on days that we could bring in children and uh, we could travel to the different floors, do you have set in advance a program she provided to those who come in mm -hmm. that explain the floors and what you could bring and mm -hmm. not bring to the foods for the picnic or provided ahead of uh, the attending uh, individual. Sure. So you could walk in the door and be told there's food available to come to the picnic on that floor. I, sure, no, that and that's a have? great question. So just a, a few things to clarify. It's all fake foods, it's just play. Um, and everything that you see in these photographs in all of the activity stations is provided by the Walters. And it's only set up for the two hours that the program is taking place. So if this specifically um, is a photograph of one of our events, but if you were to come to the museum tomorrow, for instance, that wouldn't be set up. This is specifically for sensory morning. Do you have to pre-register to come to the picnic? So you would pre-register for the entire event. And what happens when you pre-register for a sensory morning event? Um, I would follow up with confirmation materials that gives you an overview of exactly what you can expect in the morning. Everything from parking logistics to which entrance you're going to use, who you're going to meet. I also send out some of those social stories that I had mentioned at the beginning. And then on the morning of the event, when you come to the museum, just as you noted, you are handed a program um, that outlines every space in the museum that we'll be in. So for the sake of containing and making sure that we have these um, rich program you know, materials and activities set up, it is limited. So um, what you're seeing here, for instance, that morning at the museum or that sensory morning, we were only focused in Italian Renaissance galleries. And so it's just on, on the third floor. So when families would come in, it would say to them, or you know, they, they would receive a program that would say, um, take part in activities on the third floor Italian Renaissance galleries, take part in a studio activity downstairs in the lower level, or visit the sensory break area. And those three main spaces are the only spaces that they would be utilizing, certainly from 9 until 10 when the museum is closed to the public. Once the museum opens up, they can access the entire space. But these activities are only set up at designated spaces. The first two hours in the morning for which an activity that you pre-register. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm a member of the Walters, but I can't re recall receiving 
uh, a notice ahead of time that you had this available for for my particular case, a nine-year-old. Sure. Um, did that go out to members, or does it go out to yeah. what kind of individuals? No, so it's a great question. And to be honest, over the years, the way that we've marketed has changed quite a bit. When the program was first starting back in 2010, we really wanted to make sure that we were um, very directed about who we invited to the program because of concern that it would get too large for us to be able to handle. I mean, one of the things that we really wanted families to know is that if they were signing up, they were guaranteed an intimate morning at the museum. We run, within family programs, large festivals where we see over a thousand people, and we didn't want it to take off in a way that we couldn't accommodate the needs of the audience that we were trying to serve. So over the years, the way that we have gone about marketing to families to let them know has changed a bit. As a member, I do believe, and I'm looking at <laughs> manager of family programs, Rebecca is sitting right here. Um, but over time, that's now something that is showing up in members' magazines. So there would be, just like you would find in our brochures, which are at the back, um, a brief description of what Sensory Morning is and what dates you could find. In terms of being able to, to access a greater idea of what the program is that's more than just a sentence, that you would look for on our website in particular. Um, and you know, for, for takeaway from this morning's event, if this sounds like something that you're interested in, certainly by giving me your direct information, then I can ensure that you are part of our mailing list. Um, the way that we advertise now moving forward beyond Facebook and beyond our publications is that everyone who's participated in an event, so over the last 11 events, every time there's a new program coming up, I will directly send them the information so that families that I know that we've already um, met and that we've already built a relationship with and, and have come to the program and are interested in coming back know exactly what dates to look for. Does that help answer? Well, uh, to some degree, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so again, that idea of play and making materials available as much as possible. As I had mentioned, we do have three, or we think about it in three primary um, uh, spaces throughout the museum. So the collection area and the galleries, the studio always has a related art project, and then the sensory break area in our auditorium. And these are just like the activities upstairs and just like the activities in the sensory break space are staffed by museum educators and volunteers. One of the things that we think about are um, sensory concerns that might arise from various materials, so making sure that there are a variety of things that can be used or modified. Clay has been one that we've seen quite a bit. Um, we have some who come and who can't wait to jump right into it and might spend the entire two hours there. And then others who um, are not as excited about touching the clay. And so that would be a perfect opportunity to provide model magic or um, other sensory um, materials that have a similar effect but not, a, not the same feel. The sensory break area, if you're not familiar with the layout of the Walters, is on the lower level, um, just outside of where the studio space is. And it's an audit or the lower level of our auditorium space, which we set up with a bunch of um, different materials, different tools. Um, it's an opportunity for them to get into a darker and quieter space. Um, we do keep one of the doors open. Again, that's staff to make sure that everyone who's in there is safe. But anything from parachutes to um, books and uh, different weighted vests and um, that's balls and so forth. Place in the basement, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so all three of these spaces are occurring simultaneously. And so families are welcome to use any of these spaces um, at their leisure for the entire two hours. So this past program in December, um, we had the pleasure of being able to pilot a sensory resource fair, which um, was quite successful. There are some things that we took away from it and that we learned um, so that we can make those modifications and adjustments moving forward. But we did have five organizations who um, were on the sculpture court with us to provide um, additional resources to families who were here for the event. So um, Art with a Heart, 
Annapolis Music Therapy Services. Again, Autism Society of Baltimore Chesapeake um, came back, and then Kennedy Krieger was there. <laughs> um, and verbal beginnings. So this is a, an overview of, um, or an aerial shot of what it looked like. We had an art show that um, was the result of a program or a class that was led at Art with a Heart, but in conjunction with Autism Society at Baltimore Chesapeake. And so there's also student work on the um, floor as well. Art with a Heart brought an art making activity. One of the other things that we were able to um, incorporate into our most recent program is that we had a couple of students from um, UMBC who are involved in the Human Centered Computing program this past semester join us. And they were working specifically on creating 3D models of some of the pieces within our collection so that um, participants could have a hands-on experience touching um, some of these essentially artifacts. Um, I should say, you know, when we're in the Greek and Roman galleries or any galleries for that, matter majority of pieces that we're looking at are bronze or marble and that's one of the things that would come up at each of the stations is having samples so that we can talk about what the works are made out of but that there is an opportunity to be able to touch the real thing and what they did in addition was to help build pieces that mimicked exactly the works of art that we were making direct connections to So I had mentioned earlier that um, over the past few programs, evaluations have really been um, readdressed and, and edited to make sure that we are collecting measurable data. And um, the two primary things that we are most interested in when we receive feedback is uh, really learning whether or not this is a family's first visit to the museum. Accompanied with that would be why they came. Um, when the museum opens at 10, we do have a lot of families who are participating who didn't know that sensory morning was going on. So they naturally, you know, just become part of the activities without necessarily knowing the audience that it's intended for. And so that's been a really positive thing for us, you know, not only that peer modeling, but also educating um, other visitors on the programs that we offer. And then in addition to learning whether or not it's their first visit, the thing that we're most um, interested in learning is whether or not it met their needs and if they'd uh, be excited to come back to the museum. Um, we do print out the evaluations on the back of the program flyers that we pass out, and Rebecca has been really helpful in distributing those and making sure that they're collected. Um, they're also redistributed through email the following Monday. And then beginning in December 20, um, 2012, so you'll see in the graph what, what those look like since the programs since December of 2012. Okay, so this is just <laughs> quite a bit of information, but um, what you'll see in the graph is where it really, where attendance jumped. And the event that I was referring to earlier where Pathfinders and Autism Society picked uh, our program up and promoted them, um, or promoted it rather through Facebook, happened in March of 2013. So the program right before December of 2012, our projected combined attendance was 70, and then we had an actual attendance of 40 participants. Whereas in March 2013, so the next program we were running just three months later, the projected attendance was 133, an actual attendance of 98. So that that spike was really huge for us. Um, we have. This is available on the website. This information is not is not available on the website. No. How do you access the dates? The data. Well, this you have this is all scheduled for activities. Mm -hmm. Registered adults, thirty three. Uh, is this only for your purposes, or is this not for us? Like this it's, yeah, I'm sharing it today just to give you a sense of how our program has grown, but it's not something that families interested in registering would, would necessarily need to access. In terms of the dates, um, towards the beginning of the presentation, sorry, I'm sure there is a much easier way to do this. So. On the far right, if you were to go to our website, we have the next two programs 
constantly up. So right now, the ones, if you were to go to our website right now, the two program dates that are made available to families um, is the March program and then the program that's occurring in July. And then in the summer, we'll post the next two programs that are occurring in October and December. So just in terms of being able to you know, plan ahead and take a look at calendars, those two dates are always, and the next two program dates are always available on the website. And again, if, if, um, if this sounds like a program that you're interested in attending, um, once families have um, come to the program and have shown an interest in coming back, those are the, the families that I will directly contact to let them know about upcoming programs before they might even show up on the website. So this data is just to give you a sense of how programs have grown. And again, here it is in graph form, so that um, the two things that we are really measuring can, can be seen quite nicely here. The idea of um, families registering for a program and then actually attending. We always over uh, book, I should say, when I had mentioned that we cap at 125. And the idea is that on the day of, we're really hoping to see about 100 participants. And at this time, given the number of staff that we have, the number of volunteers we can assure are going to be on site, and then those three spaces, um, 100 seems to be just the right amount so that um, it does remain intimate and everyone is getting individualized attention. Um, and then we always account for things like weather. So there is the program on December 13th with the asterisk next to it was the first big snow that we had had of winter last year, which is why the actual attendance has dropped quite a bit. But you can see from where we started back in 2010 to where we are now and where we, um, you know, on average see our programs, we've grown quite tremendously. Um, and these two graphs directly relate to the questions that we ask in our evaluation. So that idea of whether or not it's um, their first time visit and if they want to come back. And the graph on the left is really exciting for us because one of the things that um, you can see is that as we offer more programs, the families whose first time it is at the museum is going down, which is precisely what we want. We want to be able to build um, an environment where they feel welcome to come back, not only for these programs, but ideally coming back on their own time um, and accessing resources that are available throughout the weekends or just feeling comfortable navigating the space. And then on the far right is that um, follow-up question of would you return? and um, I, it pains me. I wish that it was 100%, but we have had a no response a couple of times. So otherwise, the overwhelming um, you know, excitement from the programs and the desire to come back to the museum is always pretty high as well. All right, and then this is um, the final slide. And again, just wanting you to know that our upcoming program date is March 29th. And we are always looking for volunteer support. Um, we also have had fa uh, families and um, advocates in the community who are interested in just getting a sense of what it looks like so that they can better speak to the program. So even if um, you were not available to volunteer for the entire shift, but we're just curious to see it in action, um, please let us know. We would love to have you on board. That's it. And then the other thing that I'd pulled out, um, I had mentioned earlier, these are some of the resources that we always have available. So they are, right now we have three different color packs and they correspond to different collection areas. Um, the blue pack, and you're welcome to explore any of these, but the blue pack um, connects with our Greek and Roman galleries and the idea of building proprioceptive skills, um, the idea of figures and spaces and feeling pretty comfortable with mimicking and um, body positioning. The red pack corresponds to our Italian Renaissance, so it's all about faces and feelings and um, understanding and reading expression and emotion. And then the yellow pack, which you'll see in our March programs, um, which corresponds to our Egyptian galleries, and that's really about language and communication. Um, in each of the fun packs, you'll see a lot of the same things, but there are also, there are always fidgets. Um, and then books that are related, there's a welcome message for families uh, who are coming to the museum. On the back side is a floor plan of the museum itself, highlighting some of the dark and quieter spaces in case um, if you're coming to visit us on a day that is not set up for sensory morning and you're looking for reprieve or an area to get away. Um, we also have museum manners presented in a way that um, follows language that's consistent with what they might hear um, at school. 
And that's about it. Can you find cards? Um, give ideas for conversations and um, just some quick activities that adults can do. And I should mention all of these are available on our art carts um, every weekend. So Saturdays and Sundays between 10 and 3, anyone who comes into the space can check these mater materials out. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, our achievements program, which is for three to six year olds, and they have come for intensive group treatment. And then I also run a couple of different social skills groups here for kids of varying language abilities. So now I'll turn it over to Jim. And um, my name is Jen Horton. I'm a clinical social worker here at CARD. And um, I actually run one of the social skills groups with Stacy called Circle, which is Communication is Reciprocal. Communication links everyone, as well as um, co-lead another one of our groups, Start. Uh, so Stacy and I uh, developed this presentation for you today because we really wanted to be able to focus on social skill development and help parents, really empower parents um, to be their child's social coaches and really work on some of the social skill development that's so crucial and important um, for the future. Uh, but before we go ahead and, and get started, um, we did want to just say, it's sort of like, um, like Stacy Duvall was saying, this is uh, really meant as more of a general overview. So if you have any individualized treatment questions, we definitely encourage you to talk with your own speech language pathologist for your child or clinical social worker. Um, if you have any specific questions um, regarding your child, we, we'd be happy to talk with you after the, the session. Um, but really, this is more of like a general uh, overview, overview with strategies uh, that, that we have uh, been researching and found helpful. Um, and in addition, I would love to get a sense of sort of who's out there. So can you raise your hand if you're um, a professional who works with individuals with autism? Okay, great. How about parents of younger kids, like five and younger? Okay. How about school-age kids, like six to 12? And how about our, our adolescents, teenagers? Ah, very brave. <laughs> awesome. So, um, so we've got a couple parents, a nice mix of parents and professionals. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the, the goals for today. What we'd like to do today is discuss the key components of social development, uh, identify common social deficits in kiddos with ASD, learn the difference between skill acquisition and performance enhancement strategies, and then communicate those strategies to you um, that would be helpful in increasing social opportunities in school, in the home, and in the community. It is quite ambitious, so there's a distinct possibility that we will not finish everything, but Stacy and I have written the presentation so that if we were to not get completely through it, um, we, we hope it's written in a direct enough language that you can take some of these strategies and, uh, and move forward and understand them on your own. Um, we really tried to save sort of the nuts and bolts for the very end so that if we weren't able to get through the, all of those things, you have enough resources to get yourselves going. And also we've included our contact information. So if there's questions that you have going forward, um, something that you're, you're uh, concerned about, feel free to give us a call. Um, I actually do social skills evaluations with families, so if there's something that you really want to really work on with your child and start to develop a treatment plan, feel free to get in contact with me and we can meet um, at a later date and kind of go over more specifically with your child. Uh, so with that very ambitious uh, start, let's go ahead and get started with just talking about a brief basic overview of social interaction. And we're using a bottom-up approach because when we develop social skills, um, we're really developing them from sort of the more simplistic to the more nuanced. Uh, so the first, we have this body. We have an awareness of others and, and uh, individual self-regulation. So we're aware that others are in our space. We're aware of how, our, how we're feeling, what our energy level is. Uh, and that you can see with toddlers and young children. Going forward, getting a little bit more complex, there's initiating with others. Uh, we're calling this the face because we're you know, really being able to start to focus on other people. Uh, we're initiating and we're also responding to other people in a social way in a group setting. And then most nuanced would be the mind. We're starting to engage with others in an interaction that's reciprocal, that goes back and forth. And we're also starting to take other people's perspectives. So taking a look at this, we go sort of from more simplistic uh, to more nuanced and complex. Um, giving you some examples of what this might look like. For body, that would be sitting still, looking at what the group is looking at. So being attentive and focused on the group. 
getting a little bit more complex, face would be asking someone to play or answering someone's questions. And then getting further, uh, more nuanced or complex is having that multiple turn conversation or, and being able to know and explain someone else's feelings. Uh, so this can be really challenging. So let's talk a little bit about some of the barriers that are facing our kiddos with ASD. Within the body, there's a reduced awareness of others in their environment. So challenges of no, sort of knowing who's there, um, what they're doing, um, and then there's difficulties with self-regulation. So that ability to be able to know how I'm feeling, know what my energy level is. Uh, there's challenges with coping strategies, being able to calm myself if I'm upset. For face, we see a reduced social initiation, so kids may possibly be interested in engaging with other people, but they don't really know how to do so appropriately. So there may be some inappropriate in interaction um, or very little social initiation. And then as well, an inconsistent response to others in a group. So some response sometimes, but maybe not to everyone and, and maybe not all the time. And then the last uh, social deficit we're going to be talking about is with the mind. There's a lack of social reciprocity. So that, that flow, that give and take, the, the ability to understand others' cues, their facial expression, their tone, their body language. So challenges with all the verbal and nonverbal reciprocity. And then a self-focus, uh, which is a difficulty in sort of understanding and identifying other people's emotions. Um, so with all of those social deficits, it can be really challenging for our kids to learn social skills. Um, but that's not what our focus is. Our focus is going to be on a, more of a strength space. So now we have the challenges. We know what we're working with. Let's talk about how how we go about uh, handling these things. Um, so the, the two main ways we're going to focus on that today, um, Stacy's going to talk about skill acquisition, and I'm going to be talking about performance enhancement. These are two approaches to help with these deficits. What do we do here? Um, this, for skill acquisition, that would be learning a skill that the child does not know or doesn't know all of or hasn't mastered and generalized to a variety of populations or different communication partners in different settings. Whereas performance enhancement is encouraging a child to demonstrate a skill that they know but they're not currently performing for whatever reason. Uh, so to explain that a little bit further, it might help to just say, instead of saying, skill acquisition and performance enhancement, because that's a bit of a mouthful, it might help be helpful to think of this in terms of can't do versus won't do. So can't do is a skill acquisition deficit. That means that the child does not have the skills needed to perform whatever the behavior is that we're asking them to do. They may have some of the skill, some of the time, but they have not mastered the whole skill and been able to generalize it to um, multiple conversation partners or other places. Whereas performance enhancement is that won't do. So the child has the ability to perform the task or this behavior, but will not do it. Could be from lack of motivation. It could be from sensory sensitivities or anxiety, attention difficulties, impulsivity. Lots of different factors could be impeding the child, but for whatever reason, they're not doing it. And a nice way to tease this out or to figure out what it is is to ask the two, these two questions. Can the child perform the task with multiple people across settings, uh, with peers and adults, uh, even during unstructured time? And the second one is, will the child perform the behavior when motivated by a reinforcer? And if the answer is no to either of these questions, it's a skill acquisition deficit. That child does not have completely have the skills to be able to do those behaviors. Um, so it's important to think about what your child is, is doing currently and think of them in terms of a skill acquisition deficit or a performance enhancement deficit. Because a lot of parents say, oh, my kid can do that. They're just choosing not to do it. It may be that they truly don't, haven't completely developed the skill to be able to do, to do that successfully sort of across settings with across people. Um, so it's important to, to really to be able to, to differentiate between the two. So let's just take a, a look at um, two brief examples, and we'll see if we can figure out which is which. I'm just going to read through both of them, and then we'll try and figure out which one is which after. Um, so example number one, Jason goes into his classroom every day and says hello to his teacher and some of his classmates. However, when his parents take him to an after-school party, he sits quietly with them and will not say hello to anyone. 
Example number two, Laura's mother often asks her questions and Laura will answer. However, Laura will never ask her mom any questions back to make it a reciprocal conversation. And Laura doesn't have reciprocal conversations with anyone else either. So taking a look at this, what do we think example number one is? Very good, yeah, performance enhancement. He's, it's a, a deficit of performance enhancement. Jason can do this skill. He's shown it with his teachers, he's shown it with his classmates, likely he shows it with his parents, but he's not showing it at the after school party. Any idea might, what might be the barriers? Social anxiety, definitely. If he's very comfortable with his classroom and his classmates, he may not be as comfortable with the kiddos that are at the after school party. Anything else? Party atmosphere? Because um, it's kind of like out of routine. Like in the classroom, that's a routine you never know, five days a week. Yes. And then after school party is just every now and then. Mm -hmm. And by being every now and then, mm, it's not in that setting where you used to doing it all the time, so it just does and that's also could be anxiety too, because he's not he's not used to it. It could even be sensory sensitivities. If it's a party atmosphere, it might be louder than the classroom. So there could be a lot of different barriers that are impacting Jason's ability to, to say hello to people. Um, example number two, obviously, is skill acquisition. But what do you think? Why is it skill a skill acquisition deficit? How do you know that the child can't do it? Mm -hmm. Maybe because. From that, if the child never performed that test, she's good at responding back, but can't figure out how to ask a mm -hmm. question unlike to answer one. Absolutely. And we see that a lot with our kids with ASD. They're, they're pretty decent at answering questions, but that asking questions back is a skill that a lot of uh, kids with ASD don't have. So that's where Laura is right now. She's at the skill acquisition deficit. She can't do it. So now we're going to talk about some strategies um, that will help to work on uh, skill acquisition if the child doesn't have the capability. Take it away, Stacy. I'll give you that to clip. All right, so now we're going to take a step back and look at some specific strategies we can use to help promote skill acquisition in our kids with ASD. Um, kind of a vocabulary buzzword we can use for this is assimilation, which is basically teaching the child to adapt their behavior based on the environment. So this isn't changing anything about the environment or anything outside of the child. This is specifically changing how the child is behaving in different environments. Um, so this slide is just kind of an overview of the different kinds of strategies I'm going to discuss. And then on the following slides, we'll get into some more specifics with activities and ideas. So first, we want to promote attention and self-regulation. Like Jen was saying in our bottom-up approach, if a child can't attend to others, if they're not aware of others in the group, if they have a really difficult time regulating their own body and emotions, they are not going to be necessarily able to initiate with others or respond to others or understand other people's emotions because they don't have those basic skills. So first, we really want to make sure that our child's attending and engaging with others in their environment. Then. For things that are more directly related to initiating and responding, we can directly teach children expected social behaviors. And then in the moment, we can use prompting to support those social behaviors. And then finally, for children that maybe are doing well in some basic rote social behaviors, we can start encouraging perspective taking to look at that more nuanced social interaction. So first, let's talk about some ways that we can promote attention and self-regulation. Um, to promote attention, you can do this in a lot of ways. You can um, develop activities that require your child to um, pay attention to other people. So some games that could include are passing ball games or really any kind of turn-taking games where there's an object that needs to be passed from one way to another. When you're first working on taking turns, um, having an object to pass to other people in the environment makes it a lot easier for a child to attend to what's happening in the group. Um, but you can also do this at home in more naturalistic environments, such as if you're sitting down at a meal, you can start passing dishes at meal time. And that, again, just requires the child to, OK, I have this. I'm giving it to you. I need to look at you and pass it and just kind of promote that awareness of the other people in their environment because those people are interacting with the same things that that child's interacting with. 
Also, if maybe there's not an object to be used to promote attention, start asking questions to draw attention to the group or activity. I find as a professional, I often tell my kids what's happening instead of making sure they know what's happening by asking them questions. So I'll you know, say, oh, Joe, it's Joe's turn. Now it's Josie's turn. Oh, look, she got a red ball. Um, and instead, you can ask the child those questions if they're able to answer basic WH questions. Um, that's another way to kind of redirect them. You know, if they're looking off in space, be like, oh, look, whose turn is it? Or, um, you know, what's coming up next? What should she do next? Um, and once the child's, you know, working on attention, we also want to work on self regulation. And this is another thing that's really specific to each child. So you're going to want to work with, if you're a parent, the child's um, occupational therapist or other professionals to really develop specific regulation strategies for your child. Um, but whatever strategy it is, you want to use simple language and visuals to help the child understand how their body is working and their energy levels. And so a couple of programs that have been developed are the ALERT program and zones of regulation. The ALERT program works off of um, an engine system, so it talks about um, my engine's running low, my engine's just right, or my engine's running high. Um, and the zones of regulation talks about energy levels on a color-based system, so blue is basically the equivalent of I'm feeling low or tired, green would be just right, yellow is I'm starting to get a little worked up, maybe I'm a little frustrated or a little excited, and then red is um, I'm pretty much in crisis, I'm really angry, I'm throwing a tantrum. Um, and we have specific reference information for these programs at the end of our presentation. Um, and then once your child is able to more successfully identify their body energy level, um, you want to identify strategies that can calm your child in the moment. And again, this is going to be specific to each kid. Um, but these could be anything from deep breathing to getting pressure to having some movement to maybe um, alternating preferred and non-preferred activities. Um, moving on to some more activities for direct teaching. Um, these are probably the most common ways you can directly teach kids social skills. Um, one, a really popular way that was um, first coined by Carol Gray is um, using social stories. And those, um, for most professionals in the room and probably parents as well, you've heard of these. But they're basically brief explanations of expected behaviors and events during social activities. These often use very simple language. They basically summarize a social situation. They might give specific language to use in a social situation. And um, they're going to also have visuals paired with it to help the, the child understand what's happening. Then a great activity to pair with a social story is using role play, which is basically acting out whatever social skill you're trying to teach that child with familiar partners in kind of a more contrived situation. So it's not necessarily that natural setting where you want your child to be showing that behavior, but you're um, making a situation happen so that your child has more opportunities to practice those skills. And then another strategy that's really starting to become more popular and really helpful for kids with ASD is video modeling. And these are basically videos that can demonstrate or teach expected behaviors during a variety of activities. So you'll see video models developed for basic life skills. It could be washing the dishes or doing laundry, but there are also video models that are developed for teaching social skills. And one company that has created a lot of these is called Model Me Kids. Um, or you can always look on YouTube and see what you can find there. Um, on this slide, I just have an example of a social story that I recently made for one of my social skills groups. And we were working on the social skill of introducing ourselves. So as you can see at the very beginning, I kind of introduced the concept and how it relates to the child. So introductions are basically saying each other's names. So everyone has a name. I have a name. And then I kind of walk through what's going to happen. So someone might ask you your name. And then you can see I'm specifically using the language my name is. I have a visual for each one that you could point to while the child's practicing that specific language. Um, then same for what's your name. And then at the end, I kind of summarize I can tell them my name, I can ask what's your name, I can say nice to meet you, kind of summarizes the um, skill. After I read this social story in my group, and this is something you can do with your kids, we then did some role playing. We went around the room and we asked each other 
our names and we said our names. Um, and you could do that with your child in the home. First start, even though, again, this is role play, it's a contrived situation, they don't need to ask their siblings' names, they don't need to ask your names, they probably know that. But it gives them that opportunity to practice that language and to practice that skill in an environment where they're comfortable and they can be successful. And then you can slowly start working it into more natural settings. Then let's say, so you've directly taught um, these different skills and you're in that naturalistic moment, you've done the social stories, you've done the role play, you've watched some video models and the child still isn't being successful. They're not having success with this skill. So what are we gonna do next? So that's kind of where prompting comes in. And some prompts can be developed before that moment or some prompts can just be generated in the moment. You haven't really thought about it before but that's what's happening. Um, so something that would be developed obviously before that moment would be some visuals. And visuals are great ways to non-invasively remind a child what we expect of them in that situation. Um, so you can use those visuals to cue for a sequence of events. So let's say you're having a conversation and the child knows first I talk, then the, the next person talks, then I talk again. And maybe you have pictures that show each person's turn to help them, remind them like whose turn is next. Um, or you can also use visuals to prompt appropriate language in social situations. So anything that's really scripted that the child is gonna say it this way every time, you can have a picture to go with those words. So like my name is when you're doing introductions or hello for greetings. Um, another thing you can use in the moment is gestures. And again, this is not quite as invasive because you're not talking, so you're not necessarily interrupting um, the social in interaction. Um, so if your child's having difficulty paying attention, pointing to others in the environment can help them pay attention to what's happening. Um, you can also use pointing to encourage eye contact. And you can also develop some gestures to remind your child of other social skills. Um, and they could be really naturalistic gestures like waving hello um, or pointing to your eyes for eye contact or it could be something new that you've developed to remind them to you know, take turns in a conversation. Then um, a more invasive way of prompting but sometimes necessary would be um, verbal prompts. And if it's something that you've practiced with a child and it's again one of those specific um, phrases that you're going to be using. You can use partial verbal prompts, which is just basically the first sound or word of a phrase. Um, but you could run into a situation where the child hasn't been practicing that specific language and so you're going to need to provide an actual model for what they need to say in that moment. Um, a place where I use verbal models a lot is when kids are having conversations. So maybe one kid says, oh, I saw this movie this weekend. And the other kid's like, yeah, <laughs> I did too. Um, and then the next kid says, oh, this was my favorite part. And the other kid has no idea what to say next. Um, so then you can jump in and say, oh, well, what was your favorite part? And maybe they'll tell you. And then you can say, oh, you could say my favorite part was this. So that helps them figure out how to follow up that conversation. And then finally, um, sometimes you can use light physical prompts, like gently turning the child's body toward their communication partner. or uh, let's say you wanted them to wave, you could tap their hand, um, just an example. And here's just a few examples of visual cues that you could use. Um, so the first one is just a sequence of events, which is saying hello, so first look at the person, then wave, then say hi. But again, you could develop this for more complex social skills that have more steps. Um, or maybe you just have a reminder that you pull off of the internet to look at whoever you're talking to. Um, and then you can also prompt for specific language. So let's say you're playing a game and the child needs to say it's my turn so that they can um, go next. You could use that as well. So let's say now your child's pretty good at engaging in pretty simple interactions. They can ask questions, they can respond to questions. Um, but when it comes to those nuanced pieces of social language, um, they really don't understand what other people are thinking or why they're thinking that way or how could they be thinking that way. So we really want to start encouraging some perspective taking in these children. Um, and a good, way to, good place to start is to work on identifying emotions. So you want to identify your own emotions and identify others. Um, you can help your child work on identifying their own by taking pictures of them, making different faces, 
Um, if you're starting to work on, maybe your child knows when they're feeling some way and they can label that for themselves, um, but they aren't able to really generate why. Um, I've had parents come to me and say, okay, my child's sad, but they can't tell me why. How do I teach them how to tell me why? Um, so in the moment, if you know when, you're, when the child or why the child is upset, start giving them the language to talk about it. So maybe the child's crying because they didn't get to play the game that they wanted. So they come to you and they're crying, and they're like, I'm really sad. And you're like, okay, okay I know. <laughs> um, I think maybe you're sad because you didn't get to play that game you wanted. And if it's something that's really common, that happens a lot, like maybe every day they like to play on the iPad for 20 minutes and then they have to do their homework. And every day the iPad time is over, they're crying and upset. Well, that's a really great place to start talking about why they're upset because maybe they know they're upset and you can model for them every day. You're upset because you lost the iPad. And then eventually you can start asking them to identify that cause because that's something that happens really often. Um, you can also work on identifying others' emotions and you can use characters in books. There are so many books that have great um, facial expressions. Um, for younger kids, the Mo Wellams Elephant and Piggy books, I don't have this in the PowerPoint, um, but I was just looking at these the other day. They have, they address social skills and they have fantastic facial expressions and they are really, that elephant and that pig are really feeling what's happening in the book. Um, so if you find books like that, they're, they can be a great resource. And then also, again, you want to promote this skill in as many environments as possible, so point out other people's emotions in real-time events. And then once your child is getting better at identifying their own emotions and other people's emotions and why they're feeling that way, you can start working on appropriate responses to express those emotions or to adapt your behavior based on other people's emotions. And just to kind of talk about how to start to work on this, um, first, you want to just provide language to use during emotional moments. So maybe it's, I'm really angry, I need a break. And again, that kind of brings in that self-regulation strategy piece too. Um, so knowing that this is how I'm feeling and this is a strategy I need to use to make myself feel better and being able to express that. And then also, if you point out others' emotions, maybe start by giving your child a choice of what they could do to help their friend feel better. Um, so maybe it's, oh wow, he's really sad. You could say, I'm sorry, or maybe he just needs a minute. Maybe we can give him a minute. Often, kids that are really feeling their other <laughs> kids' emotions just you know, kind of smother the other kids. Um, so teaching them that maybe we can give him a minute and then we can try to make him feel better. Um, I think, yes. Now Jen's going to go over some strategies for performance enhancement, but just to kind of take a minute, did anyone have any questions over any of those strategies that we just discussed? Okay. All right. So now you have a sense, uh, hopefully a better sense, of how do you help your child to acquire skills that they may ha not have had before or may have had but not necessarily um, generalized to multiple people in multiple settings. Now we're going to talk about what do you do for the kid who won't do these things. They have the skills, they have the capabilities, but for whatever reason they just won't do it. Uh, that's when we're going to be talking about the performance enhancement strategy. So just as an overview, um, Stacy was talking about how assimilation is sort of the buzzword for skill, uh, for skill acquisition. It's helping the child to adapt their own behavior to fit the environment. This is the opposite. This is adapting the environment to fit your child. So what can you be doing and can others be doing in order to encourage um, social skills? So we're going to, um, it's a little bit of a shift in, in what we're talking about. Uh, the focus is more on others and more on your child, but in, a more, in more of a motivating kind of way uh, to help your child to start to generalize some of those behaviors uh, that you know that they have the capability of, of doing, but they're just not doing. Um, so the, the ways that we're going to be talking about it today are to use reinforcements to increase uh, motivation 
to educate others about your child's strengths and weaknesses and give them some strategies in order to engage, um, to start to modify external factors in the social environment to make it le you know, more likely that your child will want to engage um, and feel less, um, maybe less anxiety or, or uh, less sensory sensitivities, to allow for breaks uh, and as well to prepare your child for what to expect. So we're really thinking in terms of what are those barriers that are stopping the child right now? Is it anxiety? Is it sensory sensitivities? Is it motivation? So we're trying to kind of hit each, you know, each of those. And you probably have a sense of what's sort of what are, what are some of the main barriers for your children. Um, so starting to identify what the main barriers are and start, starting to work on those might make some headway in, um, in the social skill development. So um, the first one is reinforcement. We all know what reinforcement is. It's providing some sort of motivator uh, to encourage and incentivize these behaviors. Um, so start by just identifying multiple activities and objects that are reinforcing and motivating to your child. Set clear expectations of what those behaviors are that you're expecting, um, and then even providing visuals to support the child. Um, because it's really important to be super clear about what it is that the child needs to do to get whatever that reinforcer is. Um, so if it is um, asking questions of a of a peer or a sibling, you know, you really want to try and work on their ability to ask questions. You know, you might say, Let, "We're going to ask three questions, and then you know, you get some verbal praise or you get some, um, an edible reinforcer, whatever is motivating to your child." But you're really clear as to what the, that expected behavior is, um, and then. Uh, certainly praise and, sm and noting small improvements. You know, we're not shooting for this child is able to have, uh, you know, a five turn conversation. You know, we're just focusing first on greetings or focusing first on answering questions appropriately. Whatever it is, you want to note the small improvements. And then, of course, reinforce reinforcement should be uh, immediate and appropriate. So we're talking about using small reinforcers for small items, you know, larger for, for more complex items, and, and really should be immediate um, because it's oftentimes hard for kiddos to um, equate the two, that I'm doing this behavior that I'm supposed to be doing and now I get this reinforcer if they have to wait five hours to get it. So it really should be something that's more immediate. In addition to reinforcing that behavior, you really want to educate others. You know, it's this is not something that Stacy and I are saying, you do this, you just do, you do all this, parents, go for it, have fun with it. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping that you create sort of a social team for your child. You know, and that social team could include siblings, cousins, friends in the neighborhood, kids of, you know, of your friends, people who would be willing and open to help work with your child and be role models for them. Um, and educating them, teaching them prompts and strategies to work with your child, whatever works best. There may be things that your, your child necess doesn't necessarily feel comfortable doing. Give the people who are going to be uh, interacting prompts and strategies to work with your child. Um, there was a, a there, one of my coworkers has um, went to a party where the child is older, um, but has a really challenging time answering certain questions. So as par as family members and friends came in, they were given little slips of paper that had different questions that they could ask the child so that the child wasn't being asked the same thing over and over again, and they weren't being asked questions that were challenging or, or um, you know, would, would lead them to have anxiety. They were asked questions that would make them feel successful. Um, so, you know, trying to encourage and let people know sort of what works best for your child uh, can be incredibly helpful. And there's also lots of information out there as far as really educating other people. Uh, the toolkits from Autism Speaks are great. They have, if you look under the family support toolkits, they've got one for parents, one for grandparents, one for siblings, and one for friends. And they're really written, especially the siblings and the friends, are super um, <coughs> developmentally appropriate for kiddos, you know, that are in the six to 12 range or 8 to 12 range um, that can really be, I think, beneficial for telling other people uh, about autism. So, and they're free to download and print out. Um, if we've talked about reinforcer, reinforcing, we've talked about including other people in, uh, 
in this environment. Let's talk about modifying the social environment so that we're lessening the anxiety and we're also um, lessen lessening if there's sensory sensitivities. So these this would be sort of the ideal social environment for engagement. You have low lighting. None of, you know these lights actually aren't that bad, but the, you know low lighting are, is nice. Um, few visual distractions so that you're encouraging that focus and attention on the group um, and the children facing one another so that you're already setting the kids up for this is where you're going to focus your attention. And then you also definitely want to consider the number of communication partners and lessening the demands on the child. And what we mean by that is just, you know, if you're focusing on social interaction, well, don't make the, the other content, whatever the, the things that they're going to be doing. You might want to use really simplistic games. If your focus is on turn taking, don't use like chess or something that is already cognitively demanding. You know, using Go Fish is okay with kids who are older and maybe, you know, developmentally that might be below their level. You may want to use that in just in order to encourage the turn taking or encourage some other social skill. Um, so, you know, it's it's okay to start to do some of these activities with your kids, with other people that, that are part of their social team um, to really try and, and work on them generalizing some of these skills. Uh, certainly allowing for breaks. I've had a lot of parents that'll say, oh my kid, you know, they can go, they can go to a family event and then they lose it halfway through. Well, chances are that that was so socially demanding that they didn't, and they didn't get any breaks. It's okay for them to have breaks. You know, as long as it's okay for you too, it's okay for, for the kids. Um, and it can make them much more successful when they are socially engaged. This will be um, just our example. On Thanksgiving Day, Sam often has a hard time interacting the entire time. In order to increase his participation, his family uses breaks, and he follows a schedule like the one below. And it's very, notice it's really specific. It says this is exactly what the expected behavior is. So Sam goes in, he knows exactly what he's expected to do. There's no surprises. Now, we know that this doesn't always work out in real life. You know, things do happen. But at least Sam has an idea of what's going to be happening when he's in this event and that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. He gets some breaks so that he can recharge and regroup. Um, so I say hello to my cousins. I help set the table. There's your, your social attention piece. You know, he's got to work together. Then he takes a break. He can have, and if you need to use a timer during that time so that he knows, okay, once my break is done, I'm coming back. I eat with my family, I take another break, because eating is a little bit longer, right? We're going to probably be there for at least 45 minutes or half hour. And then finally playing a game with my cousins. He may need another break before he goes, or maybe that's the end of the day. Um, but just point being, it's OK to, to pepper in those, those breaks, because that will allow for better social interaction when the child is engaged, if you allow them to have that downtime. Any questions about that? Yeah? Now, what age would you say this is appropriate to do for? I would say this would be appropriate for school-aged kids. You know, probably not, I, would, I wouldn't say not like with the, the little guys, although you could do, you definitely could do a visual strategy um, for some of those things. Um, actually, you probably could modify that for any age. What, what would you say, Stacy? I mean, you work more with the little ones. I think you just modify it. Yeah, and maybe for a little one, it is just a schedule. It's a more simplistic schedule. So maybe you say hello, and then I'm going to be playing until we eat. And so that's kind of my break. Um, and then I eat, and then I get to play again, and maybe that's all it is. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Any other questions? This far? Um, so again, kind of working with that decreasing anxiety, helping your child um, to better prepare, help them to know what to expect. Um, so there's lots of ways, but this was just a handful of ways that that Stacy and I um, have. Uh, established for you today. The first is to use our visuals. We talked about um, using a social story or using a visual schedule. Um, these things help to prepare your child and give them an idea of expected behaviors uh, and what's going to be happening. Have a family calendar so that they can start to anticipate and plan. And some of you may say, well, that's not going to work for my child because if they're anticipating and planning that far in advance, they're actually just going to be anxious the entire time. You know, you know your child better than we do. So if you know that your child needs to have certain things to, 
know the day before versus a week before, then go with it. Um, that's why we made all of these things check boxes so that you can check off, as, you know, as parents you can check off and say, okay, I want to try this. Uh, this is not good for my kid. I, you know, I don't want to even give this a go. Um, but you, you know what kind of anticipation your child would need, but just the whole point being to have them to start to really be more aware of when things are happening. Um, take them to the environment beforehand um, to familiarize themselves with one aspect of the situation, if that's possible. You know, so if you're going to go to some sort of, um, let's, you're going to go to the science center with a, with a group, with a a class field trip, if you can take your child there beforehand so they can get an idea of sort of what's expected and what's going to happen, um, that can really decrease anxiety. Introducing them to one individual or a small group of individuals, if they're going to be meeting a, a huge group of people, um, you know, maybe have, having them meet one or two at a time if possible. And then last, make an action plan with your child to help them to identify ways to cope. Um, so this kind of goes back to what Stacy was talking about with self-regulation. We really want to encourage children to be more aware of themselves how they're doing and then more aware of the, what works for them to calm down and you'll find a lot of, a lot of kids do kind of know um, you know what it's going to take for them to calm down I worked with a, a mom the other day who said that she was really surprised she didn't think her child was really attending um, when people would say um, take a deep breath or you can take a break now but she saw her, she saw him in a situation that was really frustrating to him, and he was, he's pretty minimally verbal, but he was pretty frustrated, and he went into the corner of the room, and she heard him whispering to himself, take a deep breath, it'll be okay, it's not a big deal, and, just, and he did, he like kind of talked himself down. So it's, it's really great to encourage kids to start to do that, because the less anxious they are, the more socially attentive they can be. When are we going to use these strategies? lots of places. <laughs> We're really thinking about the, the home. Use family members as much as possible. They're great social partners uh, and they're really helpful when learning a new skills like Stacy was saying. To learn it in a safe environment that's predictable with people that you know and love is a whole lot easier than learning it with strangers um, which is why I've been practicing this in front of my husband um, for the last you know five days. Same sort of concept. Uh, school Peers are all over the place in school, so um, sometimes it's more challenging to get schools to, to back it, but as much as you can encourage schools to do um, lunch groups and peer groups, mentors, some schools are, you know, schools are willing to do different things. Um, as much as you can put it into the IEP so that the school is held accountable, that's a good thing. Um, and a lot of times kids have individual, so, um, and we talk about this later, but I'm just going to throw it in now, um, kids have in, have individual speech language uh, therapy and if they just have individual but no group at a certain point you definitely want to encourage them to have some sort of group so they can be working on generalizing some of these skills because it's one thing to do it with adults and professionals it's a whole other thing to do it with peers um, so if you can encourage um, in the IEP meeting to do that that's great and then last is um, community community events and activities are always great and we will go into there's a ton out there um, and a lot that's I think underutilized so it's important to, to take a look and tap into some of the resources that we've outlined here. So with that super ambitious we actually got through a, quite a bit of it um, but Stacy's gonna give you some deep breath reminders and then we'll um, have time for questions. Any questions for performance enhancement strategies? Okay, so Jen and I have obviously just kind of thrown 10,000 strategies at you. Um, so we just wanted to take a step back for a second and just take a deep breath. And um, remember that we're just going to want to tackle one social skill at a time. Um, my mother always told me when I was younger to choose my battles and not try to fight everything. And um, I think as a professional, I have realized how right she was. Um, so we don't expect kids to conquer having a conversation all at once. You want to break that down, tackle one thing about it at a time. Um, also remember that incremental progress is still progress. We want to celebrate the successes no matter how small. Um, a lot of the kids we work with and um, have in our homes work 10,000 times harder to do something that seems so small to most other people. We want to celebrate the fact that they've worked that hard to get to that place. And um, even though the skill might seem small, the work was not small, and we want to celebrate that. 
And then also just remember that everyone does need some downtime to recharge, kids and adults alike. So um, make sure you're giving your child that time to <clears throat> just relax and recharge and make sure you're trying to incorporate that for yourself as well. Um, so we do have a little bit more information about places to use these strategies, but we wanted to make sure that we had some time for questions, especially since our time's almost up. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts, comments? Yeah. I have a child that 